Let me extend a warm and sincere welcome to each of you for joining us on the auspicious occasion of this public event uh, in, in uh, study of the Alzheimer's Disease Institute and Association. We are glad to welcome you. I'm Bill Henrich. I'm the president of UT Health San Antonio. And uh, I think I'll take a, the president's prerogative and in just a couple of minutes tell you how this all got started. It got started about six or seven years ago when my friend and colleague Glenn Biggs came to see me because he was suffering from intermediate stages of Alzheimer's disease. And he asked me where he could go. He asked me where he should go. And it was apparent at that time that there was no place to go. There was no place in South Texas to go. There really wasn't a comprehensive place in Texas where you could go. And there were really very few places in the United States where you could receive accurate diagnosis, have access to clinical trials and the like. And as a result, uh, I pledged that day our university's resources to creating such a place. And in the short time that has elapsed since then, I'm proud to say that the Glenn Biggs Alzheimer's Institute uh, for Neurodegenerative Disease has taken flight. And today, it is an articulated center. It's the home to the only Alzheimer's disease research center designated by the National Institutes of Aging in, the, in the Texas, one of only about 30 in the United States. And more than that, what it has done is coalesce our efforts in research, in clinical trials, and in clinical care, caring for the caregiver, the whole spectrum of what's needed in this complicated and dreadful illness to care in a comprehensive way for patients. So I'm very proud of the progress that's been made. And I'm pleased to say that in this positive trajectory that we've launched, we're going to start just this month, groundbreak, have a groundbreaking on a new brain health building, which will house this comprehensive center in it, along with it co-locating the Department of Neurology and the other associated experts who will provide comprehensive care in one setting, in one place, for people to come. So a great, a great progress report on what this center has done and what it means. I am incredibly proud of Dr. Shasadri, of the faculty in the Glenn Big Center. I'm proud of this conference. I'm delighted that you are here to hear more about current late-breaking trends in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. So welcome to everybody. Now my partner in many of these steps along the way, which I know you can imagine have been many, has been uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn Biggs's widow, Anne. She's been my friend for longer than that, but she's been my strong partner in all elements of creating this wonderful center. And she has been a wonderful fundraiser. She's been a great counselor to me, to Suda, to all the individuals who have counted on her and called on her for her sage advice. So my happy duty next is to introduce to this audience Mrs. Ann Biggs, who will make her remarks and welcome all of you. Please, a nice welcome for Ann Biggs. I'd like to extend my word of welcome to each of you for being here tonight. I know that each of you have a special reason to be here. You have a loved one or a mate or a friend who is affected by the Alzheimer's disease. And it's so good after a three year t uh, interval that we are once again able to come together and to work toward a common goal 
As Dr. Hendricks has said, the next tsunami is Alzheimer's. So we need to be prepared to face it. And we've made great strides in the last few years. And it's my hope and prayer that I live long enough that we will find a cure and make progress so that our children and our grandchildren do not have to go through the things that we have, are experiencing. Good evening, buenas tardes. Thank you very much for being here. And I have to tell you that we've been together with the scientists that you've seen here and some more in the audience, some coming from Africa, from Europe, from Brazil, Chile, Argentina, uh, talking and discussing what is the latest thing that we should know and what can we do in Texas. And it's wonderful to see how the, the, this institution and the leadership of Dr. Sechadri has moved and pushed and pulled from abroad to bring these scientists and to unite us thinking how can we serve and how can we do much better. Of course, having the support of all of you, the institution, it's uh, amazing, the community, the caregivers, the participants in our studies, and of course, the people living with memory problems. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you Dr. Maria Carrillo. She is uh, the scientific, chief scientific officer of Alzheimer's Association. But she is also a neuroscientist. She obtained her PhD at the University of Northwestern and has been with Alzheimer's Association for 18 years and 10 years as a leader, scientific leader. It's under her leadership that we have been able to see those increase, increase in um, funding through the Congress of the United States. So Dr. Maria Carrillo. Thank you so much to Dr. Maestre, uh, to Dr. Sashadri, and of course to Mrs. Biggs, and uh, to all of you for being here. Um, what a great opportunity that you have in your backyard to have this type of event and this first in class center that is taking off, but is already paying off in dividends. So um, congratulations to all of you. Um, but on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association, and in fact, um, also the International Society to uh, Advance Alzheimer's Research and Treatment, I start, uh, I'm really pleased to be here just to congratulate uh, some awardees. They are awardees of fellowships, international fellowships that we gave uh, in order to ensure that they could come to this conference that we held all day today, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, so we're still going strong, um, and share that wealth of knowledge from those other countries with all of those from the University of Texas in San Antonio, the Health Sciences Center here in San Antonio. So I'm going to ask them to come up, and then we'll take a quick picture, and then we'll move on with the program. So my sincere congratulations go to first Dr. Renata Leite uh, from Brazil. Please come up. Dr. Konlak Cyril from Africa. Dr. Binyam Aele from Africa. Emmanuel Epenge from Africa. And Dr. Claudia Suemoto, also from Brazil. My pleasure now to actually introduce our fearless leader, Dr. Suda Sashadri. Thank you. Thank you all. How wonderful to see all of you in person again. Your support is what keeps all of us going. The support of President Henrich, of Anne Biggs, my colleague and partner in the South Texas Alzheimer's Disease Center, Professor Maestre, 
And now I want to take a minute to share a memory of somebody who was an inspiration, Dr. George Devar Case. He unfortunately passed away last year, suffering from dementia with Lewy bodies, and his family and friends, led by Bill and Rebecca Reed and his whole family, and many of you put together an endowment in his honor. And we thought we could do nothing better than invite his son, John Case, to say a few words about his father and introduce a speaker we were able to bring to San Antonio with this endowment, Professor David Irvin from the University of Pennsylvania. So may I ask Dr. John Case? Wow, this is amazing. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to read this so I don't forget all of it. Um, my father practiced urology in San Antonio for 40 years. He was respected by his peers for his intelligence and dedication to healing. He was beloved by his patients. I think this adoration flowed from three principles he applied to his practice and life. Um, empathy, kindness, and dignity. He had an ability to really understand how a person was suffering, putting himself in their shoes, and then finding just the perfect way to communicate what they needed to hear and how they needed to hear it. Through this empathy, he was able to deliver a kindness that was heartfelt and genuine. He treated patients with dignity, approaching them not as another appointment on the schedule, but really seeing and respecting the person they, they were. He also had a self-dignity, a belief that his actions and behavior were reflections of his character. His patients, friends, and colleagues repeatedly described him as a true gentleman. Dad was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia when he was 73. His suffering finally ended last fall at 79 years of age. Uh, LBD initially manifested as REM sleep behavior disorder, which markedly disrupted his nights turning his dreams into vivid nightmares. Gradually, it presented itself emotionally in the form of severe anxiety, physically as a loss of balance and weakness, cognitively in the form of hallucinations and confusion. As it progressed, that dignity that he so valued gradually, and sometimes not so gradually, eroded. We were indescribably fortunate to have been recommended to the Biggs Institute, where Dr. Shashadri and her team administered an intelligent, multidisciplinary approach to the disease. There's no doubt in my mind that this care extended his quality and quantity of life for many years, allowing him to hold on to that dignity a little while longer. Almost equally important was the empathetic and kind manner in which Dr. Shashadri delivered her care. I remember one of our first meetings with her when after hearing my father describe his symptoms, she asked, Dr. Case, what do you think you have? And he responded, I think I have a Lewy body disease. With a nod and a heartfelt and regretful tone, she said, I think you do too. Because of Louis Body's dementia, my father had to miss out on so many activities he loved. Uh, golf games, dancing with my mom, Bible study, grandkids, baseball games, and, and uh, dinner with friends. He leaves behind a wife, two sons, and five grandchildren who really miss him. As my mother said to me, his dreams were disrupted with the disease, and ours are that would a cure, that there will be a cure to protect the disruption to other lives and dreams. Thank you. I 
I'd like to present or to introduce Dr. David Irwin, physician, scientist, faculty at University of Pennsylvania. He leads the Lewy Body uh, Dementia Center at that institute, and we have a, something to present to him. Thank you. Dr. Case would have been here at every single event. We miss him very much. Thank you for speaking. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, John. And on behalf of all of us, I um, want to thank um, Bill and Rebecca Reed and President. This is a Garcia glass bowl so that he will remember San Antonio. <laughs> we will, we do expect and hope that this will be the start of us growing towards what Penn has, which is a Lewy Body Center and better solutions for South Texas. Today, it is, uh, we now go to a panel discussion. We have a very august panel here. We have Maria Carrillo, you've already met, Chief Scientific Officer of the Alzheimer's Association. Professor David Irvin, you've already met, who is from the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Donna Wilcock, who is transitioning between the University of Kentucky and Indiana University and a national leader in biomarkers. Professor. Hector Gonzalez, who comes to us from Southern California, UCSD. Uh, Professor Augustin Ruiz, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of Fundacio Arce in Barcelona. Uh, Professor Edward Lee, who is a neuropathologist and at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Professor Monica Roselli, who is from the Florida State University. And uh, Professor Katya Roskowski, also from the University of Pennsylvania. Throughout today, we have had wonderful scientific talks, but now we would like to invite Bonnie Petrie, the biomedicine and science reporter for Texas Public Radio, who has taken your questions and offered to have the panel answer them. We have some printed answers that we'll also share with you after the event and in a blog. Um, so my privilege to introduce our own fearless reporter, yes. Bonnie Petrie. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sashadri. Thank you, Dr. Case, for sharing your father with us. That was profoundly moving and is the reality of what families and people with dementias uh, face. And so it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, and bring public questions to this panel um, so we can talk through some of this stuff. And I know you don't want to hear from me, so let's get right to it. Um, and I'm going to go to, for our first question, Dr. Carrillo, if you don't mind. Um, the question is, I'm having trouble remembering names and sometimes in finding the right words. How can I tell if it's just aging, right? or dementia, or Alzheimer's disease. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So there are a couple of questions in there. A couple of questions. I know all of this illustrious panel could actually provide a fantastic answer, because this is one of the most common questions I think we all receive when we're talking to audiences. Um, certainly, it's um, you know there are a lot of us that are, as we age, are what we call the worried well. Um, anything that might happen, we may think, oh, is something happening in my brain? And we might get worried. Um, but there are distinct differences that start to happen. And um, I know that on our website, alz.org, and we have a table in the back um, afterwards where you can get more information, we have some information that will give you like the differences between what's usual and what's unusual. Uh, and one of the biggest, perhaps, tells could be that if you lose something, very usual, we're all busy, we're all, so maybe have a restless night and didn't sleep well, um, but if we can't retrace our steps, sometimes that's a good tell, you know, if you can't really remember your steps. But, you know, ultimately, 
anybody who has a concern, especially today, when we have uh, amazing tools in the clinic uh, for being able to help a person um, just talk through those memory changes and determine whether it's something that actually should lead to treatment or whether it's something that actually is either, that is actually very treatable and not really a dementia at all, um, we should actually seek medical advice. Um, difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, very simple. Uh, dementia is really an umbrella term, and so many different types of diseases or causes can cause a syndrome of dementia. It was just a sort of memory problems that affect your daily living. Um, so it's kind of like a cancer umbrella, and then you really have to find out which type in order to make sure you're treating the right disease or the right condition. Um, so that's why medical advice is very important, and you guys have a first-class center here in your backyard for that. All right, thank you. All right, our next question, uh, Dr. Ruiz. Um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, so did my aunt. Uh, her daughter had it at around 60. My mother did not have it little family tree work there. Yeah. So what are the chances of me having it? I'm 65 years old. Well, this is, um, you know, the, the question of many people with family with, with the problem. And I um, have to say that dramatically, 12% uh, of, the, of the people uh, will have uh, dementia in, the, in their life. So this is the flat, I would say, risk everyone has without taking into account anything about the family history or taking into account any, your personal background. So that means that without any kind of uh, external or familial antecedent, you, you have a, a, a chance to, to get dementia of 12% of the people. So this is what we have. And when you have uh, antecedents in your family, um, the, the, there is an increase of the risk associated of these uh, antecedents. But in this case, for example, you have not a direct relationship between the people or the person with dementia and the person interested in, in taking her own risk. That means that they have a, a small little increase if you find out two or three cases in a family but you have not your father directly linked or your mother directly linked with you with the disease, you have a little bit more risk than 12%. Maybe you are approaching about 20%. But now, this is um, um, for, for, it's very general, I have to say. Now, the, the genetic information is transforming this concept and now, we can differentiate, for example, depending on age of onset, a group of, small group of people that have a higher risk because they have in the family a specific mutation transmitted from father to, to the son. And these people, if you carry the mutation, you have 50%. If you carry the mutation, you have 100% of having, but you have 50% chance to, to, to take the mutation when, when you are a descent. But this is very rare. I have to say the most common cases are sporadic and is, is more around the 12% or a little bit higher if you have a family with some cases. So we, we have to be this in mind and to take into account the big picture. So if you have not a direct connection with the case, uh, the risk is a little bit higher, but not too much. This is the, the answer for that, for that person. Okay. Um, our next question goes, uh, it starts with the family tree then it goes beyond that to the community, the culture, ethnicity. Um, I'd like to direct it at uh, Dr. Gonzalez, if possible. Um, my family came to San Antonio from the Canary Islands many generations ago. I have a grandmother who was born in Oaxaca, Mexico. I hear that Hispanics have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Is that true? And if so, what's the reason for that? And what can I do? I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what we do at uh, UC San Diego is study various uh, persons from diverse Latino backgrounds across the country. The rates are higher amongst people with Hispanic heritage. <clears throat> Those studies are primarily founded in a clinical sample in California. 
does that mean all that affects that the higher rates affect all Latinos across the country? Does it mean that people of Mexican heritage are more at risk? Not necessarily. Does it mean that people of Cuban heritage have higher risk? Perhaps. This is what we're trying to accomplish in our studies here in the U.S. I think th there's hope. And uh, one of the audience members came to me and asked me, do you feel hopeful about this uh, dementia and preventing dementia? And I do. I really do. And I must say that it drives my activities every day. What we seem to see amongst diverse Latinos in the U.S. is that there are things you can do. We know that cardiovascular health, cerebrovascular health, lowering your risk of stroke, even those silent strokes, even those that aren't even detected early on, if you can modify those risks, lower those risks, then you're doing something for yourself. I think I'm also very hopeful because of all the activity that's going on and because so many people are, have come to us. We've, we've managed to s successfully en enroll over 10,000 or like 16,000 diverse Latinos across the country. We want to know people of Latino heritage. And I think with that kind of inspiration, it drives hope for us to find some ways to prevent and hopefully cure Alzheimer's disease and wipe it off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Wilcock, is there a test that can determine if you're likely to get dementia? I'm sorry. Oh, or yeah. any so, one of you can answer. But. Yeah, so uh, is there a test that can determine if you are going to get dementia or if, you have, if, if no. you're at a high risk? Um, currently, no. Very soon, I think, yes. Um, and, and so that <clears throat> is, that's really been, I think, one of the biggest breakthroughs that I've seen in the last kind of five to ten years is what we all call biomarkers. And so... Uh, one of the challenges with studying any kind of brain disease is that you can't take a biopsy. Um, if, if we could, we would all be taking a little sample of the brain and looking at it under a microscope and we would be able to tell you whether there's Alzheimer's changes or Lewy body changes going on. Um, we do that with the rest of the body. That's how we diagnose a lot of cancers, right? Um, so, so we need to find a, what we call a surrogate biomarker. We need to find something that we can measure easily that is going to tell us what changes are happening in the brain. I think all of us would love to have a blood test. I think most of us probably have been to our doctor many times and had our cholesterol checked and uh, A1C checked and, and, and everything. Um, we are really close to having, I think, a, a, a battery of blood tests at our disposal that will tell us whether we have Alzheimer's changes going on in our brain. Um, there's already one that is FDA approved. Um, it's very hard to access right now unless you're in a center like this uh, where Dr. Shashadri can, um, can facilitate some of that. And that is really gonna help us when we get medicines. And so you'll probably hear more about some medications that are coming through now that I think are gonna be game changers for Alzheimer's disease. And hand in hand, the discovery of our blood tests and our, our brain imaging along with the new treatments is really gonna move the needle. We heard today from, from Dr. Owen about um, some tests that are coming through uh, for alpha-synuclein, which hopefully will give us an easier test for Lewy body changes. And uh, on the heels of that will be blood tests for uh, the other causes of dementia as well. So uh, this field has moved quicker than I thought it ever would. Um, I think if you had asked me five years ago if I thought we would be here, um, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, and, and I think over the next five years, we're gonna see that really accelerate. So um, watch this space. It's really the hot topic right now for the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to add thoughts about this? 
Any other thoughts? Oh, no? Okay, cool. Uh, Dr. Erwin, uh, no, actually, Dr. Lee is next up. Um, my father has severe dementia, as did his father before him. So we're getting into family history again. Um, my sisters and I have agreed that we will donate his brain after he dies so we can know exactly what type of dementia he has. What other diseases can present like Alzheimer's and cause dementia? Um, can, can I ask a question? I'm just curious. How many people here plan on or, or are willing to donate the brain for research? Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, you yeah. can do that here, too, um, at San Antonio. Yeah. So if we, if, we, if we roll back time to the 1970s and you look at the autopsy as a medical procedure to identify different disease processes, it's about 30% of those autopsies revealed a surprise meaning something that wasn't detected during life. If you fast forward to now, right, we have biomarker tests and MRIs and fancy PET scans and every, and the autopsy surprise diagnosis rate is still 30%, meaning that we discover things that haven't been documented that we didn't know was going on during life. And that's not, a, a part of that is our, our physicians are better and they have better, better diagnostics and treatments, um, but as pathologists, we have also gotten better in discovering new things about the brain. So uh, it may be surprising to find out that people with Alzheimer's disease clinically and also Alzheimer's disease in their brain, the neuropathologic change, only about a third of those cases only have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which define Alzheimer's. So the vast majority of cases also have other proteins, like alpha-synuclein that causes Lewy body disease. There's a protein called TDP43. Um, and so we're, we're realizing that there, there are many different processes that are occurring in the brain that could lead to dementia. Um, there, there are clinicians, and, and especially at special, specialized centers like this, are excellent at diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. Um, what we're learning now is that there are other processes going on as well that we want to be able to understand and harness and diagnose uh, before people, before we have to do a brain donation. Um, again, I, I share previous sentiment that there's a lot of hope. These are discoveries that are being made now through brain do donation that 10, 15 years ago we didn't really know about. Uh, and, and the whole field is, is catching on and we're addressing this in, in every way we can. May I continue? Nice. So I think Dr. Lee is exactly right. And the, the one thing I would like to add to the hope is that our ability to, um, to advance neuropathology, st the study of brain at autopsy, and telling us that Alzheimer's and even aging is very complicated and is due to more than just one protein cause means that we, you know, you can look at this as a half glass full or half glass empty. We choose to look at it as half glass full, and it's very positive. It means that we have to go beyond trying to treat just the amyloid plaques or tau tangles you hear about that are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's. It means that we're going to go beyond that because to truly treat this, it's a complex disease. We're going to have to have complex polypharmacy just like we do for other diseases. You combine medications for heart disease. You have multiple statins now combined in one, one pill. You do this for HIV. You do this for cancers. So we will be doing that for Alzheimer's. And we've just started with two <clears throat> approvals for Alzheimer's just in the past, what, two years that tackle the amyloid plaques. Very soon, we will follow that with, with medications that treat these other proteins. So that polypharmacy is coming because of all the discoveries that we've made, been able to make through neuropathology that Dr. Lee and many others have led. All right. Yeah. yeah. It's very exciting. Right. Exciting. Okay. Uh, Dr. Raskowski, your turn. Um, my friend, who's a retired nurse, was recently diagnosed with progressive aphasia. I also heard about Bruce Willis's diagnosis, which first was aphasia and is now frontotemporal dementia. Um, how do you test for aphasia specifically? And how do you tell if it's due to dementia? Okay. Um, so, 
So I guess I would start with saying that frontotemporal degeneration is an umbrella term for all of these syndromes that have sim heterogeneous pathologies, but they all affect the frontal and the temporal lobes of the brain. And depending on where the pathology hits, that uh, determines how you present. So for example, there are people uh, with frontotemporal degeneration who have behavioral problems. So they're very impulsive, they're disinhibited, they're compulsive. And then there are some where the pathology um, hits the brain in the areas of the brain that control language. And there are different types of these aphasias with mean difficulties with language. So in some cases, people have difficulty understanding language, understanding single words, and understanding objects. And then there are some people who have difficulty expressing language, so talking and grammar. Um, so it, in, in order to see what kind of um, frontotemporal degeneration syndrome we have, we have to do a very thorough diagnosis, um, a very thorough examination of um, their symptoms, and we do neuropsychological tests. So for aphasia, we have specific tests of repetition, of naming, of uh, fluency that help us figure out what kind of aphasia it is. Um, and then we, based on that, we have an idea of what part of the brain is affected. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so let's uh, talk a little bit about um, caregiving, which is just profoundly difficult and painful and, and uh, you need support. So as a caregiver, Dr. Roselli, um, this is for you. As a caregiver for my wife, I am not participating in a support group but He's probably him. should. Um, how He's can I gauge the effectiveness of a potential support group? It's, it's really scary to sort of reach out in that way. Um, so, um, I didn't, I didn't yeah. follow so what? It's a, it's a caregiver who's not currently in a support group. How can he find a support group? How does he gauge if a support group is for that person? Well, uh, there are many ways. I mean, there are like uh, support groups depending, like I'm from Florida, and then uh, in the community, we usually have uh, groups that are uh, helping, like in, within the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, we have a group of communities who help and, and, and support these focus groups. And we also have educational uh, um, material that we distribute to uh, different uh, memory centers. And uh, people are uh, usually encouraged to call the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease uh, Center if they would like to be enrolled in one of these support groups. And I bet that here in, in in Texas, in the, and I guess one of the members of the of the um, uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in Texas uh, uh, can give you more information on how you can get enrolled in uh, a support group because something that is extremely extremely important is to get education on what the um, Alzheimer, what Alzheimer's disease is because uh, 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 we need to know that uh, one thing is the related to the symptoms that we have. So we may have changes in memory, changes in language, and as we were discussing, as Dr. Carrillo was saying, that could be normal aging. And another different thing is the etiology. What is the cause of these changes that are, are, are manifested as we get older? And that is going to require a, a not just like a contact with a general physician, but a, a contact with experts in neurologists and neuropsychologists to give you the precise symptomatological diagnosis and then the etiological diagnosis. What is the cause of the changes that this person is suffering? So I think it's extremely, extremely important to get educated on what the stages of the diagnosis is. Because sometimes the diagnosis is made by general physicians and not necessarily are the experts in the 
the area, and as a consequence of that, there may be a misdiagnosed. And this is, that this is why it's so important that as a family member of someone who's suffering from memory decline, education is extremely, extremely important. Okay. If I may just quickly yes, follow up, um, and even just looking at our lovely audience we have tonight, you're not alone. And I think that's one of the great benefits of uh, participating in a support group, which I think was the question. The, I think that's just so powerful to know that you're not alone. I know there are people here that have lost loved ones or have loved ones who are affected by dementia. The just being there and being available to each other to be able to not stand alone is incredibly empower empowering. Secondly, we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, as Dr. Rakowski had said, there are certain types of symptoms, presentations amongst people with a certain type of dementia. That caregiver may have some information for, information for me that I can understand. I think this is presents as a really powerful tool. I've seen it work in group settings, <clears throat> and I think just getting to that point to cross the threshold and to say, I need help, and I need the help and support of a group that understands where I'm coming from, that doctors like us don't know necessarily what you're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. Those little tips and tricks, if you will, on how to manage somebody who, with some changes in behavior, are incredibly empowering. And they work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can, can I ask Go, um, Yeah, definitely. Because I, I think this is such an important topic. I, remember that the, the best thing that you could do for your loved one is to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. if, if you take care of yourself, you're going to better take care of them. And if that means support groups or education or asking for friends for help or getting respite care, know that, that you shouldn't have guilt about taking care of yourself because you're really doing it so you can take better care of them. Mm -hmm. so, so give yourself that freedom. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's go to Dr. Irwin. Uh, thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk to us about uh, Louis bodies is what we're gonna be talking about here. And I'm trying to find the question. There it is. Um, my 80-year-old mother has not seemed herself since my father died a year ago. Uh, recently, she called the police to report that there were three kids and a wolf in her yard, but the police didn't find anything. Uh, her doctor said that she might have Lewy body dementia. What is it? How do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? Sure. That's, um a uh, very good question. It's a very complicated issue, the diagnosis of Lewy body disease. Um, one of the cardinal or core features that helps us know if it's likely that Lewy bodies are in the brain and causing the symptoms is what we call well-formed visual hallucinations. This is seeing people or animals rather than lights or non-specific visual stimuli. Um, sometimes there could be illusions where we can see shadows and interpret that there's a face or a person there. Uh, these could be very subtle and they could be very hard to tell from what we call delusions, which are the beliefs of something that is not factually true. So um, it can be hard to tell if your loved one has these symptoms. For example, it's not uncommon with different forms of dementia to have um, beliefs that someone may be a suspicious uh, delusion is what we call it, where Maybe an item was misplaced and there's the belief that someone may have taken it. Um, so I think getting a full neurologic evaluation and a specialized center like here where um, there are the resources and the expertise to really tease apart these complicated what we call neuropsychological issues um, to help with the diagnosis because Lewy bodies are invisible in the brain with current testing. There's, um, a lot of optimism for tests that are coming to clinical practice soon or what we call biomarkers that'll be able to detect that Lewy bodies are there and really need comprehensive evaluation to determine that and then to optimize treatment. And the treatment of Lewy body 
similarly re requires uh, comprehensive and collaborative care, usually across different types of physicians, because we know that Lewy bodies affect different parts of the brain and even the peripheral nervous system. So uh, feeling lightheaded when standing up, having constipation that could be very problematic, uh, the hallucinations that we describe, and fluctuations. The disease could change from day to day or even hour to hour. And how we manage those symptoms with different medicines requires uh, a detailed collaboration with your physician and your physician, your clinical team, because some of the medicines that we prescribe for one symptom could affect the other. So our goal usually is to find the lowest dose of a medicine that helps target the symptom that's causing the most problem, and then systematically going through other symptoms to get the right types of medicine or the right balance. And that requires a lot of input from patients and families of what you're experiencing so that your clinician, your doctor, and their team uh, knows exactly what to target to help you. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. Um, Dr. Wilcock, I have had diabetes for 20 years. I'm worried it'll lead to dementia. So I test myself regularly and I make sure my blood sugar is controlled. What are my risks? Yes, so um, it's interesting. Uh, actually, research uh, from our own group in Kentucky has shown that um, contrary to, I think, what a lot of us have thought, which is that diabetes increases your risk of dementia, um, of, of Alzheimer's, sorry, um, it actually seems to increase your risk of dementia, but not necessarily the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's. It seems to be more related to cerebrovascular damage. Um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gonzalez was talking about silent strokes and how they can sometimes impact your cognition. So um, it seems as though a diabetes impacts the health of your blood vessels in the brain. And I always talk about that as being, um, thinking about your brain as the engine in your car and, you know, the, the, the um, the vessels are delivering the energy, like the, the fuel line that runs from the gas tank, right? And so if you damage the fuel line to your car, the engine doesn't work and, uh, as well. And, and if you damage the blood vessels, your brain isn't going to work as well. Um, we know that um, it's not as clear cut as that. So a lot of times people will have a lot of damage to their blood vessels, but also <clears throat> have plaques and tangles in their brain. Um, what seems to happen is that the damage to the blood vessels seems to lower the amount of pathology that you need to get symptoms. So you might have less plaques and tangles, but have more severe symptoms because of that damage to your blood vessels. Um, and so that seems to be the risk with diabetes. Um, uh, the, you know, controlling blood sugar is so critically important yeah. and um, it does seem that if you can maintain appropriate control of your blood sugar, your risk is significantly reduced um, uh, and, and com fairly comparable to someone who doesn't have diabetes. So maintaining blood sugar control is so important and also getting some exercise, uh, just, you know, just taking walks. Um, nothing, you don't need to get on a treadmill, <laughs> but <laughs> take a walk. Um, you know, I, I think um, it was said by one of the other panelists, what's, you know, what is good for your heart is good for your brain. And, and that's what we've seen time and again, control the blood pressure, control the blood sugar, um, you know, get some mild, moderate exercise, um, stay social. All of those things that we know are good for the heart, they're going to be good for your brain health too. Yeah, if I could just step in and just add another point here is, look, we're in San Antonio. Uh, the, the percentage of Latinos here in this part of Texas is very high. I, it must be at least 50% because your whole state is 40% Hispanic. This is a major problem affecting our community, a major problem affecting our community. I think that uh, diabetes is a major contributor to cerebrovascular disease, strokes, mm -hmm. silent or otherwise. You can do something about that. What we've been doing is looking at people in their 40s mm -hmm. and how that relates to cognition. What are those early changes that you can make? How can you empower yourselves and your community to make a difference? So I, this is a major problem affecting our community, and I think this is an actionable target for us to make some serious strides to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias 
in our community. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I can add sure. something on, on this because there are some kind of controversies between the connection of uh, Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. Uh, there are evidences that actually genetically are not connected. But one important thing that didn't mean that the non-genetic risk factor are connected and are the same. So if you are controlling the non-genetic risk factors for diabetes, probably you are controlling also a portion of the risk factor of Alzheimer's disease. And that is the reason why the improvement of the risk in cardiovascular uh, um, factors and controlling those factors, you are also reducing the prevalence of, of, of the incidence rather than the prevalence of the disease. So this is important. It's something like a sensor you have. Maybe you have not the biological connection, but you have the epidemiological connection of non-genetics. And actually, there's um, a very uh, interesting tie now with uh, a phase three study of over 2,000 people of a diabetes drug, very popular diabetes drug, semaglutide. Uh, you might not know it at, by that name, but I think you see commercials on like Ozempic and these, yeah. right? So um, it's being tested for Alzheimer's right here in over 2,000 people. So this team is a part of that. Um, and we're all, you're also testing the US pointer study for this. So there's lots of opportunity for us to explore this together um, because the metabolism and heart health so connected to brain health. So uh, yes, we are a site for the Evoke study, which is the study that uh, Dr. Carrillo was talking about, as well as many other studies. One of the questions I, the audience did have was, um, should we go for clinical trials? And how do we uh, sign up for clinical trials? And why should we go for clinical trials? Should we wait for those two medicines we have heard about that the FDA is considering and Medicare won't pay? So I'm going to answer all of that uh, to the best of our this thing. So yes, these medicines represent a step forward, a piece of hope, but at this point, FDA is properly concerned about risks associated with the medicine, like brain swelling and hemorrhage, as well as how big is the effect? Is it big enough to justify a full approval? Right now, what they have is what's called an accelerated or conditional approval, saying we think it'll work, but if there is full approval, then it's a very exciting time. But you also heard that most people have many things contributing to their memory problem or dementia, and that we are probably going to need a cocktail of medications. So this is the time to persevere with even more energy in clinical trials, because it's not going to be, it's like when you have the first cancer drug that maybe extends life by six months. That's not the time to stop. That's the time to go for the better medicines. We now want to test medicines that may be beneficial without those side effects of brain swelling or hemorrhage. And so you can, we will answer the questions that we had in a paper sheet as well as on a blog. There are tables outside where you can sign up and you can learn, and you, know, you don't have to be part of studies, but that is the way the first person with Alzheimer's will be cured. Mm -hmm. And in honor of Glenn Biggs, in honor of George Case, I'm hoping the first person to be cured of Alzheimer's will be right here in South Texas. Yeah. Dr. Sajadri, so give me a second. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, and so I'm gonna just let y'all answer it. We'll start with uh, Dr. Rosselli down there. And uh, the question is, um, what is the one thing, the single most effective thing I could do to prevent dementia? Dr. Rosselli. Okay, well, um, that's a very interesting question uh, because actually one important issue that we have learned in the last decade is that uh, genetics is not all. 
that environmental factors are extremely important. And as it was said previously, exercising, for example, is very, very important, but not just exercising, physical exercise, but also a mental uh, activity. And if we can keep our minds active, in fact, one of my areas of investigation, investigation is bilingualism. If you speak two languages, then try to keep the two languages active. Moreover, if you want to learn another language, try to learn another language, because all these efforts really create new connectivity. In the old days, when I first studied neuroscience, it was said that there was no new connectivity created after a certain age, but now we know that that's not true, and that we can create new connectivity if we remain active. So uh, to this person, I would suggest to try, in addition to exercise, good diet, good control of uh, your health in, in vascular terms, try to keep your mind as active as you can. And even if you, in your daily life, you already have a, a cognitive activity, try to keep it and try to look for additional cognitive activity because I think that's really has been shown that may delay the onset of um, Alzheimer's disease. So, All right, let's go to, yes, yeah. very good. You can, you can clap. <laughs> Let's go to Dr. Raskowski and then Dr. Lee and then down the aisle. How okay. about that? All right. Well, I would second that. I would second whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. That's like exercise, keeping your blood pressure, your cholesterol. That's very important. I would add one thing um, in, in the same vein of the cognitive stimulation. Stay socially active, stay socially connected. Doesn't have to go parties, but like your relationships, conversations yeah, with people, it not only can prevent, you know, dementia, it also, we've heard recently, is what the determinants of what makes you happy, um, just in general, is like the quality of your relationship. So I would say that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something very similar. So just Think of your brain almost like a muscle and just work it out. Um, and that means stay active, you know, crossword puzzles, um, social interactions, keeping your blood sugar and your blood pressure controlled. Um, we're, we're actually looking at our brain bank now and we, we do see that there's certain things that are associated with more dementia. So if you live in a neighborhood that has a lot of stress and, and um, not a lot of resources that's associated with more dementia, but if we look at those individuals in those neighborhoods who have a lot of education, they're okay. They seem to be okay in our brain bank. So, so I think um, these are the modifiable things that we could do. And just Your brain is not a muscle, but just treat it like it. Work it out every day. Um, make it a conscious effort. All right, Dr. Ruiz. Yes, I have to put in context my, my message on this because Actually, uh, the name of our institution in Spain is ACE, Alzheimer Centre Educacional in Spanish, or Catalan maybe. And that means that during the last 30 years, we um, try to convince everyone around us the need of this kind of um, 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 cognitive stimulation of the patients and also the healthy people. So this, is a, a, this philosophy is in the DNA of our organization. And in fact, we, we, we released uh, very, very early evidences of a whole cognitive stimulation of adults are improving and reducing the, the, the speed of the decline and years ago. But Luis Tarraga and Mercevada, they are here. So actually, this is. Um, in the very beginning, I have to say, what's also very controversial, that, that point of view and that vision, they, they envisioned that years ago. Now it's absolutely clear, and with the, with the finger uh, project release, and now the worldwide finger, now we are obtaining even more evidence about the need of not only controlling the risk factor, as we mentioned, but also to uh, stimulate together this kind of comprehensive and uh, um, uh, multifaceted activities that is the way, at least at this moment, we have to control the disease the more we can. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you. I, I say my single most um, important message is don't wait. Don't wait to take preventative actions now. Don't wait till you're sick. Don't wait for your kids to get sick. Don't wait for your grandkids to get sick. Start now. This whole, it's a lifestyle change. It is effective. We hope to see more evidence to support those types of messages. And I think starting now, you can reduce your risk. So take control. All right, Dr. Yeah, Wilcox. So I echo everything that you have heard here. Um, my one single thing was actually along the lines of Dr. Gonzalez. Everything we've recommended here, you can do and it will help. But you know when it will help is your children and your grandchildren because they might not be thinking about it when they're 30 that they need to control their blood pressure so that they prevent dementia later. But the literature is really growing that it's those midlife mm -hmm. health issues that can make the biggest difference. So if they have high blood pressure in their 30s and 40s, they need to get it under control now mm -hmm. even though they feel fine because that is gonna affect them in 30 years. Um, and yeah, the same with all the other risk factors, cholesterol, everything else. Midlife makes, seems to make the biggest impact, even though you can make an impact now when you're older. All right, Dr. Irwin. I agree with everything that everyone has said. <laughs> all of these are very uh, important strategies for healthy aging and the goal of healthy aging strategies. The one aspect I would add is sleep is something we often overlook and the importance of good night's sleep and what's called good sleep hygiene. We, many of us are guilty of the phone right before bed uh, and that can disrupt cycles of sleep. Sometimes sleep disorders could be a sign of an early sign of, of cognitive impairment, so important to get clinical care if you have uh, disruption in sleep. And we know that uh, sleep apnea can cause difficulties on cardiovascular stress that can also affect the brain. Um, so getting, and we don't function well without good sleep, and um, so that's an important aspect of healthy aging strategy that's often overlooked. All right, Dr. Curio. You get the last word. I think everything has been said. I'd just like to congratulate everyone here today for coming, learning, you know, you know, stimulating your own cognition and your memory. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So congratulations to you. <laughs> All right. We are out of time. We went over time. Uh, oh, a song. Well, we'll get to that. So thank you, thanks to all the panelists. I'm going to ask everybody to stay just where they are. Mr. Mm -hmm. Clifton Jansky has kindly agreed, as he did three years ago before COVID, to lead us all in a song. And as we listen, we can renew our hope that by the next meeting next year, we will have even more answers. Yes. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank, thank you. And after that, you can continue to visit all the tables at the lobby and get more information. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shashadri. I appreciate it. Uh, three years ago, I sung this song at a Valentine's luncheon, and I asked people, I said, if you would like a copy of this song, just give me your email. And 30 people out of 60 signed up to get the song. And one of the ladies that got the song was so impressed with it, sent it to Dr. Shizadri, and three days later, I was singing it here. <laughs> and uh, three years ago, my, my brother-in-law was just diagnosed with Parkinson's. Now, he can't get out of bed, he can't talk, he does not recognize anybody. And this song God gave me to the caregiver as a song that they could sing to their loved one, their friend, and uh, it's called I'll Do the Remembering. You may not remember my name, but my love for you is still the same. be my prayer. 
precious pearl And if I could I'd change the world So you and me could be the way we were We can't stop the hands of time Or bring back the days gone by For all we have is the memories But don't worry I'll do the remembrance Take your hand and calm your soul Even when you don't even know who I am For your eyes just can't see All of our memories But don't worry I'll do the remembrance Just being me Years have passed and times have changed But you and me, we're still the same Our love is strong enough To see us through We can't stop the hands of time Take your hand and calm your soul Even when you don't even know who I am For oh, your eyes just can't see All of our memories But don't worry I'll do the remembrance Take your hand and calm your soul Even when you don't even know who I am For oh, your eyes just can't see Thank you all for what you do and your loved ones.